Yeah, am I audible? Okay, yeah, so we just had uh, discussed, we were discussing about the evolution of management and we discussed uh, the classical school of thought and uh, the scientific school of thought uh, just before we went for break. Before that we discussed management, a basic definition of the functions, objectives of the management towards workforce, towards uh, society, towards the organization and uh, the various skills that are required, the human skills, the conceptual skills, the technical skills um, required for the different levels of management. So basically the uh, purpose of the class uh, to, for the first session was to introduce uh, the management, the concept of management, the concept of organization, the important contributors to the development of management thought uh, and uh, uh, continuing with that, we, we moved on to the evolution of management. So I intend to touch upon, if you have the books, from, from you know, till chapter uh, almost 4 today. I don't know whether I'll be able to complete that, but that's what the plan is. So I need to slightly uh, expedite the whole process. Yeah, yeah, you will send the, you will get the link towards the class. So now what I'm going to touch is uh, the behavioral error, which existed from uh, year 1930 to 1960. Uh, the assumption here about people are that they are social and self-actualizing. The major contributors are Elton Mayo, where the Hawthorne experiments were conducted. Theory of human needs, where Abraham Maslow talked about it. Theory X and Y, Douglas McGregor contributed Theory X, Y and Theory Y. Uh, in the uh, conceptualization of management about people they uh, govern or they have under them, right? Uh, the behavioral school of thought, the behavioral school of thought emerged when the need for harmony at workplace was realized. We just had Mark, Mary, Mark, uh, Mary Parker Follett saying management uh, is both art and science, uh, you know, of getting work done. So that is where the, real, the realization started beginning uh, of having uh, to get, uh, you know, to get your work done through people, 1968 uh, to 1933. From 1930 to 1960, that was a time when the role of people was significant, was being considered uh, significant and not merely as a means towards the end. Managers realized that behavioral patterns could not be easily predicted. They felt a need to better understand the human nature and became more interested in the perspective of people. The behavioral school of thought greatly borrowed from psychology and sociology. So beha several behavioral scientists, experts and their contribution to the field of behavioral school of thought uh, you know, are there. For example, uh, the way you uh, studied about various other contributors in other schools of thought. So you had uh, the human relation movement which is also called as Hawthorne studies, which uh, the Hawthorne Western Electric Plant began in 1924, where numerous experiments were conducted to study the work related factors that affect the employees morale and productivity. These experiments laid the foundation of industrial psychology and evolved as a study of employee motivation morale and human relations. So the, the, uh, the experiments that were conducted were the illumination experiments between 1924 to 1927, relay room experiments between 1927 to 1932, mica splitting test room experiments, uh, mass interviewing program from 1928 to 1930. The bank wiring room study, 1931 to 1932. So almost from 1924 to 1932, these uh, studies were conducted to see how the uh, group in which people worked had an uh, important role in productivity. So if I look at the elimination, elimination experiments which was conducted between 1924 and 1927 was a very, very significant experiment towards understanding human psychology. The idea behind the study was, I mean, the, the, the employees were divided into two groups. One was the control group and one was the experimental group. So the control group, in the control group, there was no change in uh, any form 
in their working uh, in their working style whereas in the experimental group there was number of changes that was that were being introduced to the tune of like giving more rest you know uh, uh, breaking the number of employees into groups uh, change in illumination high illumination low in illumination towards no illumination and uh, you know uh, individual attention supervisors and researchers being at, you know attached to small groups interaction happening um, in uh, two groups were formed the first group control group was made to work under the existing illumination condition throughout the experiment tenure and the second group was made to work in a changed illumination conditions are you, are you all listening to me are you able to listen understand are you all able to see the slide and the experimental group was made to work in the changed illumination condition the findings were astonishing because the productivity of both the groups increased in the second chance the researchers increase decrease the light intensity this time also the productivity went up for both the groups therefore they reached out a conclusion that there was something more than wages incentives working hours and working conditions that was eventually driving the productivity of employees the reason could not be identified and these experiments paved the way for another series of experiments called the relay room uh, experiments relay room experiments were conducted by professor elton mayo and his associates in 1927 see uh, this was a time when lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, diagnosis was being done about how to increase productivity was it merely science or was it has it had it more to do with science and logic uh the control group and the experimental group so the relay room experiments were conducted uh, you know uh, these experiments were conducted in a test room with the help of two girls the two girls were asked to select four more girls and all the six girls were given the task of assembling telephone relays these experiments incorporated manipulation and numerous factors such as incentives work duration and rest periods duration to measure their influence on the productivity of girls the performance and productivity of girls were observed for four for five years by changing various factors from time to time the findings suggested that the variations in factors such as pay incentives rest and working hours do not cause variation factors such as productivity is it clear then came the mica splitting test room experiments where uh, the piece weight system was kept constant and changes in work conditions were incorporated it was observed that the productivity of workers increased by 15% for a period of 14 months from 1928 to 1930 21000 employees were interviewed to record their concerns and grievances the findings indicated that certain factors have an impact on the productivity of workers when the workers talk and speak out their grievances then their morale increases so worker satisfaction is directly related to the social status of the working organization then came the bank wiring room study in from 1931 to 1932 uh that was conducted to observe and analyze the dynamics of a work group when incentive was introduced for the purpose of experiments a group of 14 workers was employed on bank wiring the work was distributed between nine wire wiremen three soldier men and two inspectors three soldier men soldier men in bank wiring room study the work group formed a rule that the group would perform a certain predecided quantity of work in a day the entire group adhered to this rule regardless of pay which implies that group rules were more important for the members thus it was suggested to bring the management and workers objectives aligned to work towards the common goals and the betterment of organization wait 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 yeah so the uh, basic idea what was basic idea was to find out what went in towards the productivity of employ employees the key findings were that groups were very important the personal attention they got from the researchers was very very significant 
the employees shared their grievances with the uh, researchers and, or the supervisors and hence uh, were more happier than when they kept it to themselves. Uh, the illumination was brought down but the competition that the researchers set in between these groups, small groups brought in you know um, immense competition among these groups which increased the productivity so light did not play a major role uh, towards productivity because illumination was brought down to the level of moonlight. Is that clear? During the same time uh, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs which was uh, you know uh, which was researched by Abraham Maslow was recorded and he identified five needs in the employees which were the physiological needs which includes needs for hunger, thirst, shelter, sex and other physical needs. Safety needs include need for safety and protection from physical and emotional harm. Social needs include needs for affection, belongingness, acceptance and friendship. Esteem needs um, includes need for uh, internal esteem factors such as self-respect, autonomy and achievement as well as external factors uh, esteem factors, status, recognition and, and attention. Self-actualization needs include need for drive to become what one is capable of becoming. It includes growth, achieving one's potential and self-fulfillment. All these needs of an individual must be satisfied in a hierarchical manner which is usually not one, you know, multiple needs can uh, uh, continue to govern an individual and uh, the individual or employee can, you know, constantly pursue to satisfy a uh, number of needs at the same time. For example, while you are looking for your physiological needs, you are also working towards your esteem needs. So this was another, uh, you know, way of kind of uh, diagnosing uh, or understanding the needs in employees. Then came the famous theory X and theory Y uh, propounded by uh, I have stripped out what? I'm just looking at the theory X and Y. Okay, theory X and Y basically talks about uh, basically talks about different views about human beings. One view is fundamentally negative and referred to as theory X, whereas the other one is fundamentally positive and uh, referred to as theory Y. The points of difference between theory X and theory Y our kind of theory X believes that employees basically dislike work and try to avoid it whenever possible. It involves controlling, threatening and punishing employees to achieve goals. Presumes that employees are lazy so that they avoid uh, responsibilities and wait for formal directions. Presumes that most employees are less ambitious and give more value to secure working environment. Theory Y believes that employees are self-directing, are career oriented. They like work and working is as natural to employees as doing other activities. Presumes that a normal person can learn to accept even take responsibility. Presumes that employees are creative and ambitious in nature. So McGregor had the views that the theory Y is more valid. Therefore he proposed that by allowing employees to take part in decision making and assigning them challenging jobs, their motivation level can be increased. However, there is a no proof that this is a valid and successful theory to motivate employees. You know, what, what uh, basically all these uh, slides talked about is, or the uh, thoughts talked about is, how um, each era significant exper you know, experiments were conducted to understand the uh, to understand the contribution of people towards productivity and what can be done to uh, help people contribute more. Then came the modern approach to management which consists of uh, you know the quantitative approach, the systems approach and the, uh, the uh, contingency and systems approach, the, the uh, quantitative approach also management science. What basically this particular uh, modern approach says is 
it refines and extends and combines all the classical and neoclassical approaches to management. So the quantitative approach to management refers to an approach which is also known as management science approach. It was developed during 1950. It provides systematic and scientific analysis and solutions to the problems faced by the management. Quantitative approach to management stresses on using mathematical and statistical tools such as linear programming, simulation, probability queuing theory and game theory for solving complex managerial problems. These quantitative tools help modern managers to take accurate decisions. Am I audible to all? Yeah, look, you had one question. Carry on. Alok, what is your question? So these quantitative tools of decision making are also called the operation research tools. Uh, the quantitative approach involves using computer aided technology in various functional areas such as production, finance, costing, transportation and uh, storage. If the McGregor, you have all these in page number 15, 16, 17. 15, 16, 17. Yeah, all that is there towards the end of the chapter, first chapter. The contingency approach to management refers to an approach that was developed by managers, consultants and researchers who practice the management theories in real life. Uh, it is also called the situational approach because the practitioners of the contingency approach found that the management practices and principles you know, that worked in one situation were not feasible or applicable in other situations. So according to this uh, approach, managers are supposed to identify which techniques uh, you know, would be best act applicable in a which situation at a given time under definite circumstances. So solutions are not universal. Is that clear? So your organizational history, your culture, the situations around, the context, the decision making, uh, the complexity of the prob problem all has to be studied to replicate a solution. Right? So an example can, you know, for example, when the rate of productivity in a publishing organization needs to be increased, a classical theorist may advise a work simplification scheme. A behavioral scientist on the contrary would try to create psychologically motivating circumstances and may advise a scheme of job rotation or job enrichment. Um, a behavioral scientist may conduct a root cause analysis of the problem or situational analysis and try to design a method or technique that work best in that particular situation. Now, so a customized method could be evolved and today we are, when we look at management approach to, uh, towards the society, towards the organization, towards the uh, customers, market, we are looking at more of customization happening because it's all situational. So actually we are seeing a lot of contingency management uh, in practice uh, and uh, in prevalence. The systems approach of management basically talks about an organization as a complete system that is unified and comprises of many interconnected parts um, which is which is about the input, the process and the output. So subsystems refer to the sub entities or the sub functions that are there. Synergy refers to a situation in which this resultant uh, combined effort is greater than the sum of efforts. For example, what kind of synergy exists within the organization among different functions. Open and closed systems basically talks about how much of feedback you take from the uh, from the people, external environment, from the internal en environment for improvisation and uh, you know what kind of a flow in terms of communication, uh, processing exists. Uh, so, so there is a constant interaction between input, process, output and there is a feedback loop. So it's a uh, system oriented external environment oriented management approach and today if you look at um, you know various leaders talking about their organization their product and services they all talk about um, you know what kind of research they conduct what kind of interaction they have with this with their retailers with their consumers 
and uh, how do they use their, these feedback for the uh, betterment of the organizational product and uh, delivery of services, right? So that's about the modern approach where we are talking about uh, the uh, data analysis, applying quantitative analysis, the contingency thinking which is about situational management and the systems approach. Yes, Alok, you can. I'll send you my, you write down my email. A-N-I-T-A-M-A-T-H-E-W dot I-M-T-C-D-L at the rate gmail dot com. So you could ask me, you know, your queries. But I'm sure at least the, the whole discussion would have, you know, um, helped you to think the role of management, the evolution of organizations, you know, what, what kind of thinking is required, how it evolved. Yeah, Ashad, basically contingency think, you know, if you look at the evolution of management, we are talking about various researchers coming up and trying to tell us what, what factors will increase productivity. What should be the focus areas, isn't it? Yeah? What factors should be considered to increase your efficiency? Whereas, uh, Never mind, I'm sure you will get, you can send me, I'll, uh, you know, test mail, I'll send you the uh, details. Uh, look, I can send you the details. So, contingency thinking basically talks about, there is no universal formula for any uh, de predetermined solution or to replicate a solution. Right, so when I'm talking about this, I'll tell you, if Mr. M. V. Kamath has been, uh, uh, you know, appointed as uh, the head director in uh, Infosys, it doesn't mean what, what succeeded in a banking industry will replicate in IT industry. You know, some of the factors he still would have to identify which works for, uh, you know, the global IT industry, the uh, local factors, specific client needs, pricing model, delivery model, uh, you know, lot of factors which are, which are very unique to the industry. And then some factors which are unique to the organization itself. So before uh, applying and strategizing, he, ne he needs to understand what works for that particular industry. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yeah. So the the uh, employees you hire might be very different from industry to industry. They have their unique needs. They have their unique working environment. Yeah, so that, can, you know, somebody else did it. So I'm going to replicate it. That will not happen. That is what a systems approach. Sorry, contingency thinking, situational approach. You know, at times when you join an organization, you will find X person did this. Now he has left the organization. Y person joins. He'll come up with his own unique uh, outlook, orientation towards work and towards, uh, you know, various uh, factors in the organization. Is that clear? Open s s the systems approach. See your organization as an input-output system. You have inputs, you have processes. It could be the human related process, it could be the marketing process, it could be the financial process and then you have an output. So if there is some problem in the output, look at the process. So every, every industry's input and output and process are different. You need to analyze and diagnose those before you, you know, kind of, uh, 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 you know, suggest a solution or recommend uh, solutions. Um, Am I audible? How are the two approaches different? Yeah, with that we are through with the first chapter. Hello ma'am, how are the two approaches different?
Yeah, can I go ahead with the next? Quantitative is, um, you know, for example, if I take up a manpower planning process, one is your judgmental method where we could say that X, X increase of components, I need X number, Y number of people. When you are applying a quantitative, you could apply a linear programming or maybe a regression model and say that, you know, how many, uh, uh, how many dots fall in the same line and hence predict as many number of people. Right, some kind of a ratio analysis. So, in uh, in your actual work also, you might be doing some kind of a, you know, you have Excel and maybe SPSS where you do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, mathematical models, use uh, mathematical models and uh, operations uh, management to predict uh, numbers. So, numbers, quantitatively, you arrive at numbers. Maybe in, uh, in fixing your targets, in fixing your objectives, in fixing your goals. You know, some organizations say we want 5% growth. Now, how is it 5% arrived at? Or maybe number of, uh, you know, uh, number of uh, products. How is the number arrived at? So, a lot of, uh, yeah. Yeah, somebody said Six Sigma, TQM. I think with your responses, I can conclude that uh, this chapter is quite clear to you. And I'm sure uh, you have been, uh, you know, interacting so much that there has been a lot of takeaways. Now, when you go back and read the chapter, you know, a lot would be clear. And if you still have doubts, I have given you my email, you can come back to me. Can I move on to the second chapter, please? The second chapter is about uh, management of business environment.